welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the programme where you can have all your property related questions answered by our team of experts. Now with me today is uh, by Zoom I will say from Ipswich, John Howard, property developer, author, public speaker and estate agent. Welcome John. I'm not sure I'm an estate agent but thank you very much indeed. Well, I thought you had a number of estate agents. We do, yes. yes. I well, don't work in them, fortunately, for me. <laughs> well, there you are then. OK, and joining John is Trevor Leggett, founder of Leggett Immobilia, French real estate agents and property advisors. Welcome, Trevor. Hi, Steve. Good. OK, well, let's get on with the first question. And the first question goes to John, which is, coming into winter, the housing market seems to be quite buoyant. This is quite surprising given all the current difficulties caused by the COVID pandemic. Do the panel think that the market will stay strong through the next year? And if so, what's your reasoning? Well, we've all been surprised, Stephen, how strong the market's been since we came back from lockdown the first time. And of course, it was a pent up demand. And also, uh, Rishi did us a great favour by, uh, by introducing the stamp duty holiday. Now that finishes in March the 31st and I've just signed a petition that's going around saying it should be kept for another six months. Funny that. So um, but at the moment he, they are they are not going to do that. They are going to finish it and if you remember and you but you're both old enough to remember this that in 1989 the then Chancellor, I think it was Lawson, decided to, to stop the double tax relief on mortgages. Mm. And they had a set date of when it finished. And there was a mad scramble to, to, for people to exchange complete before then. And once that had happened, the market dropped and we ended up in a recession. So I do hope this isn't going to happen this time. I don't think it will, but that's what happened last time when we had this hiatus and then and then you know a, a, a deadline and then nothing sells for three six months hardly afterwards do you not think a total rethink of how how stamp duty is charged is needed well i know you've been and you've made you know you've made great um great strides Stephen, to to say that the the uh, i understand that that stamp duty should be paid by the by the vendor and i can understand that because the vendor has the money mm. when they complete a purchase a sale they normally have you know um cash available whereas a purchaser doesn't quite often so i think maybe it should be paid for by by the vendor i agree with you or maybe a, a mixture of the two or guess what let's scrap it all together because it's a tax on people um just discriminates people that wish to move around the country and and with the unemployment as it's going to be the one thing the government wants to encourage is people to move around the country to find employment. Well, yeah, John, but there's, there's two things here. One, one is that moving these days, the in and out costs are so expensive with stamp duty, yeah. lawyers fees and all the rest of it. It's very, it's very difficult. It's not that easy. Um, but you see, I do wonder, I, I mean, you, you're going to tell me off for being London centric, but I'm thinking in London, there's many, many people sell their homes, make a million pounds plus profit, and it's tax free. Don't you think those days are over? Well, I think in London, I think in London, it's going to get tougher in the next 18, uh, uh, year to 18 to two years. Years. I think the market in London is, has gone down, actually. I know people say it hasn't and there's lots of there's lots of activity. But I think they're wishful thinking. My view is the market's gone down. And what we're finding with our state agency, Norfolk, Stephen, we're finding people who are who are moving out of London, who are taking big reductions on the, on the price they wanted for their property. Trevor, do you want to come in on this one? What do you think? Well, I, you know, I'm not surprised that the market's picked up and I agree with John. It is entirely, in my view, due to stamp duty. I think that you know, the market was, was depressed before COVID. I don't think you know, there was some pent up demand, but I think it was more pent up taxation. So I think the release of stamp duty has created it and would have done with or without COVID. And it's proven so successful, the government surely can't go back to that. You know, it, 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 I remember stamp duty was 2 or 3% on the continent in most places. Now it's about 5% across the board. But you don't get this super stamp duty. Up, no. you know, there needs to be rethought. I think you're right. And just to see what's happened to the property market over the last eight months is... is 
proof that what they've been doing didn't work? You know, it gets a very it gets to be a very complicated subject because you you, you hear a lot of complaint about the fact that in central London there are a lot of very expensive properties mm. bought by overseas people that they're empty, they're not being used. But uh, frankly, you know, what's the problem? I, I, I think the problem was, and, and I think I understand the problem was, was that a lot of these properties were bought in corporate structures. And when they transfer the shares later, it's very difficult to actually apply the stamp duty. So I think the yeah. thought track was let's tax them once a huge amount of money if we can't get it off them again. Mm. Which, you know, really, there are ways of knowing who the beneficiaries of the companies are. We can find out with a little bit more, you know, it, it is well, possible. It's just harder. It's just a little bit harder. But by making a huge tax on expensive properties to compensate for what we're losing elsewhere is ridiculous. But again, Trevor, it's very easy to actually cope with that because like a lot of European countries, what we could do is insist very simply that any person buying a property in England, London, Manchester, wherever, has to appoint, if they're not UK citizens, has to appoint a responsible professional exactly. to manage, manage exactly. the property. Exactly. You do that, you appoint a firm of accountants, you almost create a new business in the process, yeah. and that person is as responsible as Some you accountability. Yeah, for paying, paying yeah. the various taxes. Exactly. You know, but there we are. All right, Trevor, let's move on to your question. Um, the deadline for uh, completing Brexit is here. I've been thinking of buying a property in France, but have been waiting for clarification of any changes in either procedure or costs. Could the panel give a summary of any changes they anticipate? Yeah, of course. Uh, that, regarding purchasing a property, there are very little changes for UK as a European resident or a non-resident. But when it comes to selling a property for vendors, they will be treated like a non-EU citizen. So. It means basically, as you quite rightly just pointed out, you have to have a body who represents you fiscally. So you need fiscal representation. What does that mean? That means that uh, all your invoices have to be checked by somebody and your calculation of the capital gains tax has to be underwritten by a, by a third party. Right. And that is a, is a French-based, uh, uh, what they call an organisme accredité. Okay. Um, that was for Americans, Australians, or anybody from outside the EU. That now applies to Brits. It's not a big deal. Anyone who owns a property, their principal residence in France, obviously when you buy your property, the stamp duty stays the same for everybody. Um, there's no other difference. The only thing is, is obviously that if it's your personal home, as in the UK, you don't pay any tax at all on, or you don't pay capital gains tax on your, on your main residence. So uh, that's exactly the same. That doesn't change. Okay. So non-residents, yeah, will be non-resident, non-EU. That's the only thing that changes. We will possibly pay more capital gains tax because <coughs> obviously there's going to be less things possibly you can deduct from the bill. Right. So it can be stricter. I mean, do you, th do you think uh, your, your customer base will feel any different about buying in France when we're separated? Well, if the last 12 months has been anything to go by, I would say no because, frankly, we've had a mini boom as well. Um, mainly caused by French clients moving to the countryside because a lot of people are moving from cities out to the countryside as they have done in the UK and you know that we've, we've never done anything like it. The big problem at the moment is stock because people aren't, aren't putting stuff on the market still. There's a little bit of uncertainty, people are waiting. We've got less than, we've got 4,000 less listings going into 2021 than we had going into 2020. Okay. That's see. a big difference. John, just on that subject of people moving out of big cities, you, you just referred to your agencies seeing a, a, a sort of a bit of an exodus from places like London to, to the countryside. Do you think that'll last? Well, I th it's a very interesting. We're, we're pretty confident next year that we'll, we'll have a, a decent year uh, based really on the fact that we think more people will keep continuing this trend. Of, of moving out. But of course, someone's also buying the properties in these cities, enabling these people to move out. So it's a very, very interesting situation. I think certainly till March, we'll be inundated, um, you know, but after that, we, we just have to wait and see. It does seem to me though, that the wealthier people in this country, and by the way, there's 8.5 million people in this country with assets over 500,000 pounds. And that's what Rushi is looking to tax us on, mm. assets over 500,000 to get over this COVID, yeah. which is very interesting. 
So I think, I think the more wealthy people aren't having a problem. They're moving, they're, they're moving. Perhaps they were going to move in five or 10 years time anyway, and they've brought it forward. That's what they're doing. Um, and I think that will continue for the time being going forward. And I think, I'm sure Trevor, the same with you, Trevor, in France. I, I agree with well, you. We've I, had a wealth tax, John, for poof, 30 years we've had a wealth tax. I, I've been in France for 30 years and we've always had a wealth tax. It's now a property wealth tax. It used to be on all of your assets. Right. And that, but it's a very small amount of money. Nobody really notices it, to be honest. It's, they make a bigger deal of it than it really is. It doesn't really hurt. In the UK, Trevor, they're talking about a 1% uh, one-off tax uh, on, on assets of over 500,000 um, spread over five years. And that's what I think might well happen. On that happy note, John, we're going to go to a break. So Trevor, John, join me after the break. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. With me is John Howard and Trevor Leggett. Welcome back, guys. Uh, John, your second question. Yes. The new planning regulations being brought in by government will allow a wider range of properties that can be converted to residential property. Although good for accommodation figures, will it add a further nail in the coffin of the high streets and community areas? Uh, it totally will do, Stephen, but I'm afraid they're dead anyway. I mean, the last... In, in the last um, eight months, I think we've come forward 10 years and any business that was struggling and going to collapse anyway has now collapsed or is about to collapse, you know, all the big stores, Debenhams and all the rest of it. So the government have looked at this and they've decided there's, there's a new band called E, Band E for planning. And basically they've brought into Band E or going to bring to, into Band E uh, children's nurseries, doctor's surgeries, all this type of um, all this type of uh, commercial semi-commercial activity, and and they're all going to be in Bandi, and or we are in Bandi, and Bandi in, in July is going to be allowed uh, under PD to change to residential. So it comes into force, I think, in July. At the moment, it's out for discussion, but I mean, there's not much to discuss about it. The government are going to do it clearly. Uh, but very interesting, the white paper they brought out recently regarding. Um, building in the countryside and they're going to build all these thousand mountain, thousands and thousands more homes in the countryside that's all been that's all been stopped by funny enough the mps in the countryside the ones who have got constituencies in the countryside have said uh ah, we're not having that and that's exactly what you and i spoke about steve and probably three months ago if you remember on this show so john i'm guessing we're about to have our 12th housing minister in 10 years then well, I've met quite a few of them, but I haven't met the last one. Um, he, he's the MP for Tamworth. Um, you could well be right. Uh, and if you remember, um, you know, we, we spoke about this three months ago. And the one thing that um, to remember is this year, they've only built 160,000 house, new houses. Their target was 300,000. And of course, they need to be building 500,000 houses. So in the long run, you know, the shortage of housing in the UK, it bodes well for the property developers and investors in the UK. Yes, I suppose it does. Trevor, what do you think? Well, well I mean, I, I, I agree. I'm absolutely shocked at the amount of housing that's gone up in rural areas when, you know, in the 1980s, 90s, even in the early 2000s, it was completely out of the question. And now we're seeing housing developments in the southeast with three, 4,000 homes on them. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, even in what to me looked like flood zones or very close to flood zones. There's no sustainability to them. This is the problem. No, no sustainability at all. No. No, it's, it doesn't seem like the best policy, but... Well, it se seems, again, along with stamp duty, it looks like we need a rethink of the whole system properly. How much of the office space could be converted, the, the, the excess office space could be converted? Has anyone got any figures on it? No, uh, Trevor, I don't think there's Not any figures out there, But what I would say, if you look at London, look at London, yeah. you know, there's going to be a, a wealth of uh, vacant office space. Not yeah. straight away, because a lot of people will take, you know, companies take time to get out their leases. Um, but I mean, it, there will be a, a lot of accommodation, uh, which will be converted to residential, I'm sure. 
and I think a lot of these towns um, and cities will become more more like city villages where you have a lot more um, residential accommodation in them that, than you've ever had before. And I think it's also ideal for older people. And I think there's a market coming forward for perhaps um, older accommodation for older people, which is rental, rental accommodation. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different things happening. And of course, the government are very keen on brownfield sites. With brownfield sites, you don't need planning anymore as such. Um, so the, everything is changing in front of our very eyes, I think. Really, it's very fast. Oh, you'll be pleased to know that, you know, the individual building plots that we used to have thousands of years ago are no more. As the planning consent expires, because we've got the opposite problem, because people don't build on land, they'll get planning and then leave it there mm. and keep it as an asset. Well, the planning expires and they're not being renewed. So lots of building land currently is getting lost because people have just been negligent. They've left it thinking, oh, it's just an asset. It's not a problem. We'll reapply for planning and get it automatically. And they're not getting it. Mm. Mm. Is that happening here at all, John? Well, I think the government are trying to force developers somehow to build on the land they've got planning for quicker. And I think there'll be penalties if you don't do so. So I think similar, I think Trevor, eventually that's what's going to happen here because, you know, people are buying plots and then renewing in three years time, the planning. They're and just I banking think, it, I land banking. That might change. Yeah. But again, I, I'm not sure I see the problem with land banking really in a way. Any company that is selling something has to have stock. And if you're a developer and you see a piece of land that might develop into something good, you might not have the funds, the wherewithal, the staff, the builders, whoever to do it now, but you'd, you would want to bank it, put it away for the future, would you not? Is that not just good company planning? Well, I think, I think, you know, I think that's an old fashioned attitude, Stephen, and probably you and I are I'll on the same, on that, the same yeah. uh, page on that one. But I think the modern way is, is very different. And I think, you know, we have to look towards the modern techniques and, you know, there's lots of different ways now of developing and investing that, that we never had in, in 20, 30, 40 years ago, including, of course, modular homes, which can be built very quickly. So I think that I think the whole thing is changing and I think the government are, are, are slowly changing with it. All right. Thank you, John. Um, Trevor, your second question. Uh, I understand that if I haven't become resident in France by the end of 2020, I will not have a right to lifelong health care. Um, if simply through logistics I've missed that deadline, what will be the consequences of my healthcare situation? Well, it, again, that's too early to tell because we haven't got any clarity whatsoever for retired people, I guess you're saying. Because if you have a business in France, you, you move in, it doesn't matter if you're non-EU. So providing you can support yourself, providing you have a job to go to within a company or you create a business, which enables you to survive and you've got enough money, and let's put it in a nutshell, if you can support yourself, you'll get into the health system. If you can't, you won't, unless okay. you're retired. I mean, well, it's going to be the same as what it should be. In my view, it should have always been like that. Well, and that the idea of having people roaming around the continent with no money, <laughs> um, I'm sorry, poncing off of the state from right. one to it's never been a great idea in the first place. <laughs> so. Well, it, 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 it would seem to be unsustainable, wouldn't it? Yes. But, but <laughs> let's, just take, let's just take those two situations. OK, so somebody um, during their working life is going to move to France. So have they got to try and beat this deadline of the end of the year? Or, or No, no, no. It's a, it's a, to, be, to be frank, I mean, I've been saying all along that it's not going to change an awful lot. Unfortunately, the government have had on their website that if you get in before the end of the year, it will be less complex, mainly because they don't know what's going to happen afterwards. But, I mean, I can only go by Australian, South African or Canadian clients that we have. None of them have a problem getting into the French health system. None of them have a problem. It's a little bit more long-winded. Providing you've got enough money to support yourself, you will get residency. Of course, if you're a European before, you didn't need to prove anything. No. You could just rock up and, you know, that was that, as, yeah. as we obviously know here in the UK. Okay, so, so, so if, you're, if you're retired, how, how would that situation change? 
If you're retired, the, the, the moment you could have just literally got joined the CMU, you could have gone straight into the French system. But again, it was never that simple either. You still have to prove where your revenue came from. Right. There was a reciprocal health arrangement, which I think will probably be maintained between France and the UK, although it's up to them to agree to that, which is nothing to do with the European Union anyway. There are, there's a double taxation agreement, which has got nothing to do with the EU either. There were arrangements between France and the UK that were prior and separate arrangements from the EU anyway. Right. Of course, it was simpler within the EU because you could literally go wherever you want, wherever you wanted, without being a resident. Now, if you want to be a resident, it's not a problem. The problem will be for people with holiday homes. Mm. At the moment, as it stands, with a holiday home, you'll only be able to stay out there for three months. Right. I can't see that they're going to do it. The, the French are going to make some sort of a, uh, a menagement, as they say, because they can't... You know, in a lot of areas, these people go and spend, what, 182 days a year they were allowed to spend in their summer homes and remain fiscally domiciled in the UK. Okay. I mean, they will still want to remain fiscally domiciled in the UK and they'll only be able to spend 90 days in only one broken period. Mm. That we know for the moment. But I, I think that will change and they'll be able to get like a long visa, there'll be a different visa that will enable them to stay a bit longer. And I'm guessing for somebody who's retired then, you know, the simple answer would be to look at uh, healthcare insurance and cost that into your, yeah, into well, your living it, it, everybody budget. Everybody really. in France is insured anyway, it's part of our health system. We all have private care, so we all have a top-up system. So we, we, we pay into the national insurance system and then we all have different levels of top-up. Okay. So, you know, for dental care, for example, you'll have 200% of what the state give you on top in your insurance policy will enable you to get better dental care than the standard dental care that's available from the state. Right. So you know, we're used to it, and, and I think everybody is. And there's lots of companies out there who have already got packages in place for Brits when they leave the European Union. It's all dealt with. It's ready to go. Okay. Well, that's, that's good news, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's not that's, good. that's great news. John, I'm guessing you haven't got much to add to that. That's not really your subject. Trevor's the expert on that, clearly. He knows what's going on. I'm glad, some, I'm glad something's organised for when we leave the EU. <laughs> yeah, well, at least our end is organised, John, if your end isn't. <laughs> We've got a lot more to organise than you. Yeah, granted. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. That's the end of the show. So Trevor Leggett, John Howard, thank you both very much for contributing. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me next time on Property Question Time.